now move to the motion before the House this evening, which is, this House cannot separate the art from the artist. I now look to the first speaker, Amelia Harvey, Access Officer, Kellogg College, to open the case for the proposition. Good evening, everyone, and thank you, Mr. President, for allowing me the opportunity to speak in a debate that is not only relevant in the media, but of such high personal importance to me. I'd like to preface this debate with a reminder that while the debate motion concerns art and artist, topics such as sexual assaults and other traumatic experiences, as well as their perpetrators, are highly likely to be mentioned, given the contextualization of this debate as the Me Too debate. The question of the separation of art and artist has plagued our society in recent times. The answer to this question is simple. Art and artist have never been separate. The opposition will claim, out of sight, out of mind, that somehow the blood, sweat, and tears that artists pour into their work is separable from who they are and what they represent. I am here to disagree wholeheartedly. I studied creative writing in undergrad, and I can attest without reservations that the process of producing art of any kind produces a reflection of who you are. I did my undergraduate thesis in literary translation. I invite you now to try to imagine how a complete stranger would recreate a story, poem, or text in a different language and in a different culture, but the catch is that you cannot consider the author's history, cultural background, education, family, anything about them, really. It's impossible. Translation, you have to embody another person's voice in a strange, intricate, personal way. My experience with this is why I'm on the proposition side tonight, because it was my job to give you that experience. Art is about connection, and any attempt to sever that connection, either between art and artist, art and consumer, or consumer and artist, is sorely misplaced. Our actions, however, however small, sorry, impact the role of the artist in today's world. Our choices have financial, social, and cultural implications. When art becomes a public commodity, when art becomes influential, when we directly contribute to its success, how can we deign to separate the art from its artist? Now, before I go any further, I have the honor and privilege of introducing tonight's opposition speakers. These introductions proved to be quite difficult for me, as it is tradition to include some sort of lighthearted jabs. Now, <laughs> As we've seen in the past, some members of this institution do not know what lighthearted means. <laughs> so tonight, I've decided to play it safe and go with the second most cringe-inducing thing there is, showering them with compliments in front of an audience. First opposition speaker, Sara Dubé, a second-year PPE student at Hughes College. St. Hughes College, sorry. Sara is librarian-elect of the Oxford Union. Now, if you've ever met Sara, you know that she is basically sunshine. I met Sara over the VAC, so I know from the start that she is extremely hardworking and caring. Sara is, in fact, the first librarian to display actual, actual excitement for library committee. Like, genuine excitement, you guys. It's amazing. Uh, she's also highly committed to access issues here at the Union. Just last term, Sara wanted to implement polling stations at St. Hughes outside of the Union to increase access to votes. <laughs> Now we have Beth Molyneux, a first year French and German student at Lincoln College. Beth is a member of the Secretary's Committee here at the Oxford Union. Beth is also one of those people who just radiates enthusiasm. And it's been a little different for me as I come from a grad-only college surrounded by deeply jaded DPhil students. Beth is a star debater who made it to the final of the English Mace competition and has attended debate summer camps, which I think one-ups that one summer when I went to nature camp for a week. She's an absolute joy to be around, but then again, it's only her first term on committee. <laughs> if her constant happiness ever wavers, we can always blame it on time and politics. Now for Dr. Zoe Strimple, a journalist and research fellow in media and film at the University of Sussex. As a historian of gender, feminism, and dating in modern Britain, she has researched and written on gender, dating, and relationships. With book titles ranging from The Man Diet to What the Hell Is He Thinking? Who can blame her for calling the Me Too movement lazy feminism? Dr. Strimple is a very talented writer who is sure to provide an interesting perspective for tonight's debate, and I look forward to hearing what she has to say. Mr. President, these are your guests, and they are most welcome.
art cannot be separated from the artist for three main reasons. The creative process, sociocultural impact, and financial dependency. All creative minds in the room know what creating a piece of work is like. It's a prolonged, arduous, at times seemingly impossible task. Art is created by people who pour an immense amount of time, thought, and energy into it. Art becomes significant when people connect to it. When you connect to art, you inherently connect to its artist. This process yields a product created for its aesthetic contribution to culture. Art also has a tendency to make cultural and political statements. And by that I mean artists have a tendency to make cultural and political statements. Art and artists are near interchangeable. While it is admittedly difficult to take down those who are now considered pillars of culture from the past, such as William Golding, Richard Wagner, and Pablo Picasso, we are in a position of moral duty to take these wrongdoings into account and modify the way we teach them and their work. The moral flaws of artists have an effect on our appreciation of its aesthetics. Nowadays, it is relatively common knowledge that Adolf Hitler was actually, in fact, a talented painter. I'm sure some of you have seen one of Hitler's paintings on your Facebook feeds, admired it for a second, and then, of course, your heads were immediately filled with the thoughts of genocide, dictatorship, and war that he, perpe that he perpetuated. This is a prime example of art that we don't visually associate with its artist, but once we learn about past infamy, it becomes nearly impossible to forget. You may have listened to Wagner's symphonies or learned about his theories without ever thinking of him, the person. These contributions to culture have been solidified due to time and a lack of public scrutiny. But in today's day and age, we have no claims of ignorance left to hide behind. Take William Golding as another example, the author of Lord of the Flies, a staple in high school curriculum in the United States that won him a Nobel Prize in 1954. In addition to Lord of the Flies, Golding wrote an unpublished memoir for his wife entitled Men and Women that detailed his attempted sexual assault of a 15-year-old girl. This information would have never surfaced were it not for a professor at this very university. This information now public, how well can it possibly sit in your minds to know that this author is continuously supported by educational systems, has been recognized with a Nobel Prize and passed down from generation to generation as an icon in literature? We have a moral obligation to recognize these wrongdoings for what they are, reflected in his art. Richard Wagner, a renowned composer and proclaimed pioneer in his field, was a vehement anti-Semite and adulterer. While his contributions are culturally revered, he, as a person, was inarguably flawed. Richard Wagner is not our contemporary, so how do we negotiate his moral flaws with his famed works? The answer is, broadly speaking, that we cannot financially affect him but we can educate about him to people with a critical lens. It must be acknowledged now more than ever because his work is a product of his existence and his actions. In modern days, we cannot shy away from accusations, trials, and skeletons in closets when they become ubiquitous in the media. We, the consumers, can have a momentous impact and can no longer claim ignorance to what is constantly in plain sight. The Me Too movement has illustrated this lack of separation between art and artist clear as day. Hashtags have become a powerful tool in determining what our society, businesses, and media outlets pay attention to. Now more than ever, separation does not exist between the public and the artist either. When I think of R. Kelly, I think of his trial, every testimony that I've ever come across in the news. These pop into my head whenever I hear remix for Ignition before subsequently clicking next. I am not alone in this. There is an entire hashtag mute R. Kelly campaign. This art has been completely tainted by the artist's actions. We now have access to a plethora of information through the internet, books, and globalization. Individuals are now publicly part of a collective whole. It has become much harder to claim ignorance of an artist's wrongdoings when it pops up on every screen, covers every newspaper, and fills up small talk with those people at parties who like to get political. We are granted the privilege of a constant influx of information. The media spread the news of the allegations against Kevin Spacey in mere hours. His lawyer left, his PR firm left, and his career came to a halt. How, with all of this, can one still think that art and artists are separate? These consequences are not exclusive to celebrities. The Me Too movement was named the third most powerful influence in the art world by Art Review this past November, 
who claimed that, and I quote, hashtag me to change the prevailing climate in which curators are appointed, prizes awarded, and exhibitions framed. Artists with allegations of sexual assault have been turned away from gallery after gallery. An artist cannot possibly be separate from their art if their financial and cultural success are dependent upon it. Consumers in the art world, like any other consumers, have recognized this and taken action. It is not only the nature of the creative process, but the nature of the rewards that we consumers can either give or withhold. We've all heard the trope of the struggling artist, the one who sacrifices material things and stable income for the sake of their art. This creates an inherent financial relationship that ends up being determined by us, the consumers, sharing artwork on social media, recommending a song to a friend, going to see a movie or an exhibition. When an artist's morals come into question, we, the consumers, also face a dilemma. Do we go? Do we not go? Most artists depend on public support, and we decide whether or not to buy their book to buy their song, to buy their painting. We, the consumers, determine what is acceptable, what rises up through the cultural ranks, and what we value as a collective and as individuals. Our power of consumers has grown considerably with the expanse of social media. Businesses listen to us. The media listen to us. We hold an influence unlike any other time. A hashtag has become more than a trend. It is a tool and we need to use it. The hashtag MeToo movement is about more than exposing people for their actions. The MeToo movement has turned individual stories into a collective force. It has created a platform for art and artists to be evaluated as one, and it has allowed for a sense of solidarity. It has allowed us to take control of our narratives, the narratives that are far too often clouded with rebuttals such as, yeah, but that doesn't mean I can't watch his movies. Or, it's unfair to judge art based off someone's past. Or my favorite, yeah, but he's an icon. If these statements hurt us in the end, it is these statements that create such a long gap between incidents and their trials and their accusations coming to light. It is a separation of art from artist. It is a justification of an artist's actions. But when we take into account the impact that we have in this world, when we take into account the nature of art's creation and of its distribution, we cannot separate the art from the artist. <laughs>